Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa salamu wa salam ala ashraf al-mursaleen Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Before I begin, you know, I'll, I'll just say something very important. Islam, Islam is, uh, I said this last night to the Khalifa Youth Circle, Islam is for grown-ups, it's for thinking people. Now, I, I used to live in uh, Italy, and in, in, uh, in Italy they have, you, they have pizza restaurants, and they have other kinds of restaurants. Well, I went for a meal one night, in Italy, and it's, there was a notice on the door of the restaurant, and it said, "In questo locale non si vendono la pizza." In this establishment, we don't sell pizza. Now, what do they mean by that? You know, in England, I don't know about Malaysia. In England, if you go out for a pizza to a pizza restaurant, it's a nice meal. In Italy. Pizza is like fish and chips. It's not something you take your loved one out for. You don't go for pizza. You go to a different kind of a restaurant. So by putting this on the door, in questo locale non si vendono la pizza, they were telling people, this is a classy joint. What we have on offer here is good stuff. Now, I'm very conscious that we need to calm down. Because and it's very noisy with this door being open. I think we need to close this door as well. Because what is on offer here tonight is not pizza. What is offered on here tonight is the answer to the needs of every person's heart. What is on offer tonight is the answer to life's meaning. The religion of Islam. So, what, in other words, what I'm trying to tell you is, listen very carefully. I, I want to set my stall right from the start. We're not here to be entertained. Yeah, I'm not going to dance or juggle. We're going to talk about Islam. And Islam is the most beautiful thing that ever came to this earth. And it's the most precious gift that any of us possess. So I, you know, I, I, I don't know why. No, uh, is there a clock here? Tell me, tell me when, I, when I've talked enough, okay? Sort of wave when I've spoken enough. I can't see a clock. Uh, I don't know why Allah Almighty has brought me all the way across the world from Cairo to be with you tonight. I don't know why Allah Almighty from the beginning of time intended that you would be here tonight. Because that's what he, he intended since the beginning of time began. His plan for each one in this room was that you would be here tonight. So it would seem to me if that is part of Allah's plan, he has something to say to you and something to say to me bringing me all this way. The problem in our lives is we don't listen to what Allah has to say. So I would ask you, my, my very dear brothers and sisters, listen to what Allah is saying, not what Idris Tawfiq is saying. That comes and goes and he'll be gone in five minutes. Listen to what Allah is saying to your heart. So, with that being said, I want first of all to, to thank you profoundly from the bottom of my heart for honoring me and inviting me to your beautiful country, to this beautiful city, to this lovely place, to speak a few words to you. You, you really honor me and I'm touched deeply that you would come and give up your time to listen to a few words that I have to say. So thank you very much indeed for that. We're going to talk about my, my own journey to Islam. 
But really, it's not, it's not my journey. My journey is no more important than anyone's journey. With, with what we're talking about tonight is our own journey to Allah. Our own, you know, in, in Italy again, there's a, there's a very famous saying in Italy. Um, Tutte le strade portano a Roma. All roads lead to Rome. You know, in the ancient Roman Empire, all the roads from all over the empire, they came from Spain and Romania and France and, and Germany, and they all ended up in Rome. Well, for Muslims, all roads don't lead to Rome. For Muslims, all roads lead to Allah. To Allah. That's why when, when, when we get on a bus or on your monorail, or when you get in the car and you think you're going to KLCC, that's not your destination at all. You're on your way to Allah. Where does this bus go, you say to the man in the queue? His answer should be, it goes to heaven. Because if we, if we allow Allah Almighty to speak, to, to whisper into our ears and to speak to our hearts, and to hold us by the hand, he will surely lead us to heaven by the way of Islam. So we begin. People have calmed down. That, that was all to get you all to calm down now. Everyone, everyone's listening, which is nice. In, uh, in December, I'll keep referring from time to time to a little piece of paper here. In, in December, I was invited to Turkey by the uh, Turkish writer and intellectual uh, Harun Yahya. Some of you have heard of Harun Yahya. He writes about creation and, and, and these matters. And he's written many, many, many books. And he invited me to talk with him and to discuss, and, and, and we made a, a television program. And it was a very privileged occasion. I, I, I was in awe of him, really. But while I was in Istanbul as well, I did something that I do wherever I go. Whenever I travel to anywhere in the world, I try and do this. I had two meetings in Istanbul with religious leaders. The first meeting was with um, His All Holiness, the Patriarch of Constantinople. Now, he, he is the head of 300 million Greek Orthodox Christians in the world. And I went, I went to what is his, his palace on the Bosporus and went into his private study and a very beautiful, sweet man with a very respectable Muslim beard very long grey beard a very, very kind, gracious man and I said to him Your Holiness, you honour me and you honour all Muslims by this meeting and on behalf of all Muslims I hold out my hand to you in peace because Muslims want to be at peace with all people of goodwill even with people of ill will, we want to be at peace with, but sometimes we can't be. So I hold out my hand and say, Salam to you, sir. And, and we spoke. We spoke for about an hour. I was supposed to be there for about 20 minutes. We spoke for an hour, and then I was given a tour of the, the archives, and then he asked me to stay for lunch. And, and when it was time to finish, I presented him with a gift. I was living in Damascus last year, teaching in Damascus. And I, I, in Damascus, they have these beautiful wooden boxes, you know, inlaid wooden boxes, very, very pretty, with arabesque designs on the front of the box. So I, I, I got one of these boxes from Damascus, and I filled it with some of my books. But the box was bigger than the books, so I stuffed all around the books, I stuffed chocolates. And so when it was time to go, I said to him, Your Royal Holiness, I brought, I brought a gift for you. I hope you have a very sweet tooth. And I opened the box and said, Because Islam is very sweet. And he smiled, a big smile, and he, Oh, can we eat them now, he said. I said, No, they're for you. And, and he, No, you must take one. And, the, and then I left. And since then, I, I've met many uh, archbishops and bishops of the Greek Orthodox Church. On the same day as I met the Patriarch, in fact, there's a picture of him in your program. The man with the big black hat, he is the Patriarch. Look at it later, don't look now. I shouldn't have mentioned that. Being a teacher, I shouldn't have mentioned that to you. Before meeting the Patriarch, I had another meeting. 
Now listen, listen to the story through before you throw me out. The other meeting was with the chief rabbi of Turkey. And I, I went to the chief rabbinate in Istanbul. And to get in, you had to go through metal detectors and screens and through doors, hermetically sealed doors that open and you go in and then they close. And there were young men with revolvers and machine guns. And it was like getting into Fort Knox. And I was taken upstairs to the chief rabbi's office and it was a very big room. And his counsel were there because he couldn't speak any English, so his counsel and his secretary. And uh, there were pictures of all the chief rabbis of Turkey of the past. And a big picture behind his desk of Kabal Ataturk, the founder of secular Turkey, and a big Turkish flag. And he was dressed in the robes of Hahambasha. In Turkish, his title is Hahambasha. And what that means in Turkish is the chief wise man. Because in 1453, when Islam came to Constantinople, Sultan Mehmet II bestowed on the leader of the Jewish community the title Hahamasha, chief wise man of the Ottoman Empire. And he granted to the leader of the Christian community, the patriarch, the title of leader of the Christian community of the empire. Don't ever believe those people who tell you that Islam and other faiths are not comfortable with one another. They always have been. And they, they, they not only tolerate other religions, they love and respect people of faith. You know, and if you're ever tempted to be suspicious of people of other faiths, you should always say to yourself and remind yourself that people of faith should never be, feel threatened by goodness. Where does goodness come from? It comes from Allah. It doesn't come from the devil. So when we meet good people, we should embrace them always. Anyway, in meeting the, the, the chief rabbi, I said to him again, my, my usual greeting, I said, Sir, you honor me by this meeting. You honor all, all Muslims. But I said, there's something I must tell you first before we carry on with our meeting. Because I don't want you to be under any misconceptions about why I'm here. I said, if you think that my being here as a Muslim talking to you shows my approval of the so-called Israel or of Zionism, or of what's happening to my brothers and sisters in Palestine, well, I have to leave, because we have nothing to talk about. But if, as men of faith, as a Jew and a Muslim, we can talk about the one God in whom we believe, and the things we want to do for his creation in this world, then I believe we have a lot to talk about. He, he took my arm, he said, you're a very wise man, please stay. And I stayed for an hour, and, and we said some honest things. We spoke some home truths to one another, but we didn't come to blows. We disagreed, but we didn't come to blows. And at the end, I presented him again with the chocolates in the box, because Islam is very sweet. And he took me by the arm again, and he said, tell your Muslim friends that the chief rabbi of Turkey said to you that Jews and Muslims share something very important in common. La ilaha illa there is no God but the one God. And with that, I, I left and I went back to Damascus. And a week later, I was sitting in the, uh, in, in the living room of the, of the Mufti of Damascus. We're watching the television. And the slaughter began. I met the rabbi just before Christmas, December last. A week later, the F-16 fighter jets moved in and the soldiers crossed in and began dropping bombs on little old ladies carrying their shopping bags in the street and little girls and boys skipping in the road and young men going home on their bicycles from work and killed them, killed 1,300 people and, and maimed and injured thousands more. And I, I thought to myself at the time, just a week ago, I was discussing what people of faith have in common. And now we watch what godless people can do with no faith. 
Let's, let's not be fooled into thinking that Judaism had anything to do with that, it didn't. And, and then uh, I returned back home to Cairo. I live in Cairo. My, my time in Damascus came to an end and I returned to Cairo. And the first thing I did in going back to Cairo was, because I write for, a news, I write for two newspapers in Egypt. On one of them I said to the editor, I'd like to visit Mahad al Nasser Victory Institute. It's a hospital on the Nile where there were many uh, men and boys wounded from Gaza. And I said to the editor, I want to go and see them and I'll write an article for the newspaper. And my plan was to go for half an hour, get their story and then leave and write my article for the newspaper. Well, I stayed for four hours. And at the end of, because I couldn't drag myself away, really. But at the end of four hours, my heart was breaking. I, I couldn't stand it anymore. I couldn't bear being there anymore. Because in, in that hospital that afternoon in January, I met faith. I met Muslims, real Muslims. Now, I said this last night to the, the Khalifa Youth Circle. You know, we call ourselves Muslims. We don't even get up in the morning to pray. Who are we trying to fool? What kind of Muslims are we? And these men, they'd lost their legs. They'd lost their arms. The one man I talked to, his little baby the day before had died in his arms. The first person I met was a little boy called Yahya. Yahya was eight years old. And he was dressed in a little red tracksuit and surrounded with plaster of Paris. He couldn't move. He could only sort of move like this because all of his limbs were encased in plaster of Paris. And I, his father explained to me that little Yahya was waiting for his, his 26th operation. 26, eight years old. And little Yahya hadn't been harmed in this latest slaughter, this latest atrocity, but he'd been harmed when he was in his mother's womb. And, and poison had been dropped from helicopters in the sky and his mother had inhaled the poison and the little baby in her womb had been harmed forever. And little Yahya, he didn't know why, he had to have 26 operations. He was waiting for the 26. And I said to him, Yahya, can I have a photograph with you? Ashen enta gamil gildren, you're a very pretty little boy. Come, come and sit next to me. So he, he moved as best as he could, the poor little soul, and got on the bed and, and tried his best to smile. You, you can look at my website and see a picture of Yahya in his little red tracksuit. And I, I met other men, all ordinary young men. They're, they're not even men, they're only boys. They were only boys, they were policemen. And ordinary people and, and they'd lost arms and legs. And there was one lad and he, he, he was lying, he couldn't move, he had shrapnel in his brain. And he'd been cycling home at lunchtime from his work at the petrol station. And when from out of nowhere all these 84 jets appeared and started raining down terror and, and one bomb landed on, his, uh, landed on his aunt's apartment building and he rushed in to save her and when he was in there another bomb came and, and he was lying there paralyzed. I met so many men, I met a doctor, a young doctor, only a boy, 22, called Issam and Issam had lost the use of his arm. It's a long story, but uh, Issam had, he, he basically saved the lives of four little girls by bringing them from an ambulance. Their mother was dead in the ambulance. And the four little girls, he knew that because they were being fired upon by, by bullets, um, he knew that if he didn't bring them all at once, if he went one by one, the last one would be dead when they got into the hospital. So he carried all four of them. And he'd been injured previously in his arm by, by more and more atrocities. And by carrying the girls, it uh, ripped all the nerves out of his arm. And, and he said to me, he'd never be able to use his arm again. And I, I tried to lighten the mood and I said, oh, so there'll be no more swimming for you then in Gaza. He said, well, actually, I was the swimming champion of Gaza two years ago. Can you imagine? And I could go on and on. I'm not here to talk about, I'm not here to talk about these men, but when I, when I finished visiting them and left, I, I said to them, I said, look, I, I can't offer you any money. You need money. You need money for food and medicine in the hospital. I haven't got any money in my pocket. 
I haven't got any money in the bank. I can't give you any money at all. But I promise you this day that wherever I travel in the world, I will tell people about you. Because people don't know the truth. And then as a result of that visit, it really touched me profoundly. The book that we are sort of un unveiling in, in Kuala Lumpur this week, Looking for Peace in the Land of the Prophets, was inspired by little Yahya and those men in the hospital. And I start the book by saying, there's this reason for telling the truth, and there's this one, and there's this one. But really, it's little Yahya who's the inspiration. We owe it to him and to our brothers and sisters to tell the world the truth about what's happening in Palestine. Because it's deliberately been hidden for 60 years. And the book, it talks about the history of, of Palestine and the so-called Israel. And it, and it talks about the, the children of Israel in the Old Testament. And, and the last chapter, it gives what I call the Ten Commandments of how to help the people of Palestine. Because you know, often people email me and they Facebook me and they ask me, and they say, Oh, Brother Idris, there's nothing we can do to help the people of Palestine. Isn't it awful? Well, in the book, I say, don't you dare tell me there's nothing we can do. There is so much we can do. When you've gone through all of these ten things and they've not worked, then come back and tell me there's nothing they can do. But don't dare open your mouth. It's not enough to sit in front of the television crying your eyes out. What good does that do anyone? You know, but as we sit swigging our Coca-Cola drinks, and wearing our Nike trainers and, and dressing our kids in pampers and all sorts of things. We are accomplices in killing people. We're accomplices in that, that little boy of eight years old. You know, in Islam, we call one another brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters. Let me just read something from the book there. This, this is the first book I ever wrote. It's called Gardens of Delight. When uh, Prophet Muhammad والسلام, was giving his final sermon, uh, he, he said this. In the tenth year after the Hijra, Muhammad والسلام, performed Hajj, the once in a lifetime pilgrimage to Mecca enjoined on all Muslims capable of making it. This was to be the fifth pillar of Islam. On the last day of the pilgrimage, he delivered his final sermon to those present, many of whom wept as they listened. Remember that you will indeed meet your Lord, he told them. So they must live in peace and charity together without greed or usury. I leave behind me two things, he said, the Quran and my example. If you follow them, you will not go astray. O oh, people, listen to my words. Know that every Muslim is a brother to every Muslim and that all Muslims constitute one brotherhood. He called aloud, be my witness, O Allah, that I have conveyed your message to my people. And there before them, he revealed the last verse of the Quran. This day have I perfected your religion for you, completed my favor on you and chosen for you Islam as your religion. We don't call one another brothers and sisters just because it sounds nice. We are brothers and sisters to one another. If someone was harming your mother, what you wouldn't do to help her? And yet our mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and children in Palestine, while we are enjoying our meal, they're tunneling under the ground like rats to get food and drink and medicine. While, while people are lounging on the beaches of Tel Aviv, they're building houses made of mud. And what do we do? Oh, there's nothing we can do. Of course, there's so much we can do. Inshallah, we'll do it. The book is called Looking for Peace in the Land of the Prophets. And, and you know, the final thing about the book before we carry on, um, you know, there are some Muslims. When I was in the hospital that day, you would have imagined I'd be hearing people say, Oh, what can we do? This is ter what a terrible tragedy has befallen us. I didn't hear that at all. All I heard that afternoon was, Alhamdulillah, Subhanallah, Allahu Akbar. 
Because as Muslims we believe that Allah is in control. Not the President of America. Or any worldly power. That's shirk. That's worshipping idols. If we believe that armies and weapons are more powerful than Allah, well we're not Muslims. Because we believe in other gods. And so instead of burying our hands in our heads in our hands and saying there's nothing we can do, we trust in Allah. And when we trust in Allah, we know that He will resolve the problem. And just as the Berlin Wall came tumbling down, and just as apartheid ended in South Africa, and just as the Soviet Empire fell, so the so-called Israel will just it will come to nothing. The Crusaders were in Palestine for 200 years. They had a kingdom there. And at the end of 200 years, they packed up their bags and left. Allah is in control. But we must never give in to people who would fool us and deceive us. So never forget our brothers and sisters in Palestine. And I'm keeping my promise to those people by mentioning that to you today. Now I can begin with my talk. So I'll be, it's called uh, From the Vatican to Al-Azhar. Often when, when I give this talk, there, there are many Christians in the audience. And I say to everyone in the audience at the start of the talk, if you've come to this talk to hear me criticize the Pope, or the Church, or Christian teaching, you've come to the wrong talk. Go and listen to someone else. Because all I have to say about the people I lived with all my life and who loved me and made me the person I am all I have to say is great respect and affection and you know when, when I was sitting I know now that when I was sitting in those lecture halls in Rome studying church history and St. Thomas Aquinas and, and metaphysics I know then that I wasn't studying to be a priest I was studying to be talking to you tonight you know, when we look back on our lives, if we look back with eyes of faith, we see the hand of Allah in all things. So I have only good things to say, and to prove it, I'll tell you a story. Okay, I, I've been a bit heavy with the Palestine. So I'll tell, you a, I'll tell you a story about Pope John Paul II. John Paul II was one of the giants of the 20th century. And the first time I encountered the Pope, the great Pope, was when I was studying to be a priest. Now every first Saturday of the month, the Pope used to hold a, a religious service. You know how Muslim, I don't have one with me, you, you know how Muslim view Sibha? Sibha, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar. Okay, we call it Sibha in Egypt. Um, what, Catholics use a rosary, it's a similar thing, a rosary. And they pray to ask Mary to pray for them. Don't think that they worship Mary. They don't. They ask Mary to pray for them. So, first Saturday of the month, the Pope, who had a great devotion to Mary, the mother of Jesus, um, he, he used to have this service inside St. Peter's. You know when on the television you see the Pope come out on the balcony of St. Peter's? He comes out like this. Okay. Well, behind him, imagine that's St. Peter's. There's a row of windows behind him. He comes out on the balcony, but there's a row of windows. Well, I'll let you into a secret. Behind all of those windows is just one room. It's one long room inside St. Peter's Basilica. And we'll imagine it goes this way. It's a long room with an aisle down the middle. And first Saturday of every month, there are chairs put out here and chairs put out here. And the Pope comes to say the rosary with, with, with the Catholics. Now, I, someone had told me that if you get there early enough, if you queue up early enough, you get to meet the Pope. It was kind of like a Madonna concert. If you get there early enough, you get to actually meet the person. So I, it was due to start at seven. I was there at three o'clock in the afternoon with all the nuns. We were all queuing outside of the bronze doors of St. Peter. And when it came time to be allowed, the doors opened. And the Swiss guards with their, with their halberds and their uniforms designed by Michelangelo, they let us in and we ran as fast as our legs could take us up the stairs inside the Vatican to this room. And I got myself sitting somewhere on the aisle here, where, where the sister in the blue hijab is sitting now. That's where I was. 
She's reading something at the moment, so she doesn't know I'm talking about her. <laughs> now she does, though. <laughs> so I was over here. The Pope, who even then, he was old and frail. Uh, he came in on this side. So he, he was very doddery and, and, and frail. And he came in, and, and people were clamoring to touch him. I'm from Timbuktu, I'm from Beijing, I'm from Sydney. I'm from, all in different languages. And you could see his face was glazed over because they were all shouting all these things. And he came up and, and I thought to myself, unless I do something, he's just going to walk past me. Because he's not hearing what people are saying. It's, it's all the flashlights and everything. So he came up and he prayed. And may Allah forgive me, I didn't say any prayers. I was thinking what I could say to get the Pope to stop. So then when it was time, he finished the prayer, he came down this side. And he came to me and... Uh, he put his hand out to shake my hand and I took his hand let me put this like this I, shook, I took his hand with two of my own okay the Pope was going nowhere <laughs> he couldn't he couldn't you know he couldn't pull away so he talked and, and the flashlights were going and, and then it came time to go so he pulled and he pulled again and the gold ring of St. Peter on this finger when he pulled, it came off and ended up in the palm of my hand like that. And the Pope looked me in the eyes and he said to me, I think that belongs to the Pope. <laughs> <laughs> and he took it back. Now, I, I tell the story because when, when the Pope died, the Muslims of Rome offered prayers for him when he was in the hospital the polyclinic of Germany in Rome. He was dying. The, the Muslims on Friday offered prayers for the Pope's recovery. They prayed that John Paul would recover. Because he was loved, the Muslims loved him, because a few years before, when the Muslim community had been trying to build a mosque in Rome, there had been great opposition to it. I was there and I, I remember the, the demonstrations and the placards calling for a new crusade to stop the infidels coming to the eternal city and to stop the building of the mosque in Rome. And it took the intervention of the Pope himself with the government of Italy to allow the mosque to be built. So the Muslims loved him. And, and when he died, a whisper went around the, the Muslim community in Rome. The Pope became a Muslim on his deathbed. No, I don't know whether he did or he didn't. Allah alone knows that. But one thing it proves, it proves how much they loved him. Because you know there's nothing greater that you can wish for someone than that they be Muslim. You know, that man you work with at work is not Muslim. And he's a good man. And you say to yourself, if only he could be Muslim. Or a sister, you know, at college with you or at school. She's a good, if only she could be Muslim. So what it tells, it doesn't tell us anything about John Paul. It tells us about how much the Muslims loved him. You understand? So I hope in saying that I've proved to you absolutely no hard, harsh feelings towards the church at all. None. That's why maybe, that's why last year in Edinburgh, the, um, the Episcopal Church of Scotland invited me to give the sermon at their religious service in their church. Can you imagine a Muslim giving the service? And I mounted the pulpit and I began Bismillah Rahman Rahim and I talked to them about Islam inside the church. And I'm going back this year when I, when I leave Malaysia and go back to Egypt. I'm home for a few days and then I go to the UK and I'll be going to Edinburgh again. And this time in the same church I'll be on the, the platform with a Jewish rabbi, a Christian minister, and a Sikh and we'll be talking again and not threatened at all you, you know, interfaith dialogue it's not about pretending that all is well we don't say oh well we all believe what we believe and there we are that's not it I tell them quite clearly you're wrong in what you believe but I say it in a very respectful way I respect that you believe that but I believe that you're totally wrong you believe that Jesus died on the cross Islam tells us he didn't it's not about pretending, but we can be friends. There's no need for harsh words in dealing with other people. So, that's another bit of a start. We're getting there. We're getting to the top. 
I should also, you know, I don't know about Malaysia. One, one of the good things about traveling all over the world is that I can say things and then I get on the aeroplane and leave. So I can say things that are maybe a little bit, oh, it's a bit sensitive, he said that. Because I don't know what I'm saying, you're in a particular situation. But something, wherever I go, I always welcome in the audience any policeman who might be sitting hidden in the audience. Because in Britain and the United States, as sure as eggs are eggs, they'll be there. They'll be hiding, listening to what the speaker is saying. And I always say to them, you're very, very welcome. And maybe by, by listening to what we say, you might become Muslim as a result of it. Because I say it as a joke, but I say it very seriously too, because, and I say it to you tonight, because Muslims have nothing to hide. Nothing at all. If I was speaking to the chief police inspectors of Malaysia, I wouldn't change a word of what I say. Muslims have nothing to hide. But also, and this is very important too, Muslims have nothing to fear. Muslims have nothing to fear when helicopter gunships blow up crippled old men in wheelchairs on the ground. They have nothing to fear. Muslims have nothing to fear when their brothers and their sons and their fathers are dragged from their homes before dawn and not seen again. They have nothing to fear. Muslims have nothing to fear when others discriminate against them or ridicule them or poke fun at them as being backward and out of touch with modern life. They have nothing to fear. Why? Because Allah is in control. Allah is in control. How could we fear? How could we not be the, the strongest of men and women knowing that Allah is in control of all things? Not this party or that one. Not this chief minister or that one. Not even this sultan or that one. There we are, God said it. Allah is in control. And it makes us rejoice as Muslims. Islam is not a threat to anyone, or any country, or any society. You know, mischief makers talk about a clash of civilizations. There's no clash. Islam is, is comfortable in any culture, and any society. Islam is the natural religion of mankind, which has existed since the beginning of time. And it answers the deepest needs of men's and women's hearts. And all that Islam has to be offered, if it could be given the chance, is to make a nation better. Islam is a blessing for Malaysia. It's a blessing for America. It's a blessing for Germany. So now let me tell you about my journey to Islam. Um, when I finished university, at about 21 or so, I entered a religious order, a Roman Catholic religious order, a teaching order. So you, you, you know what nuns are like. Well, it was like being a nun, but a man. You know, we did a specific job. We lived in a community, like a monk. Uh, Twelve or so lived in the community, and, and we talked in a school. And eventually I, I became the superior of the community, and I became head of um, teaching religion in different schools all over Britain. And then after maybe we'll say 15 years or so, maybe more, and I was chaplain in a prison and all sorts of things, I, I went to the bishop and said to him, I, I think that I want to go a little step further from being a monk in a community to being a priest in a parish. I don't just want to work with kids in school, I'd like to work with marrying people and, and hearing confessions and visiting the sick. Now, now I was very clever because I knew the bishop had two choices of where he could send me to study. One was he could send me to the, the diocesan theological seminary which was in a field in the middle of nowhere with nothing for miles around. Or he could send me to Rome. So I knew these were his choices. So when he said to me, a brother, he said, what, what are your hobbies? My hobbies? I said, oh, my hobbies are travel, languages, Baroque architecture, and opera. 
He said, oh, maybe I should send you to Rome then. Oh, really? <laughs> so I was sent to Rome, and it was a wonderful, wonderful time being in Rome. It was a very wonderful time. I saw the best of life and the worst of life. In the church, I saw holy men, and I saw men who weren't holy. I saw good and bad. I have nothing to say about the bad at all, forget that. But I saw many, many good people. John Paul, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, the present Pope, Cardinal Ratzinger, walking down the street. Many, many, many lovely things I saw. And at the end of uh, being in Rome, I was ordained a deacon, which is like half a priest. And then being ordained a deacon, I returned back to Britain and was ordained a priest and served in a parish working with people um, in the south of England. And it was my job to, to marry people, to baptize their children, to visit their, their mothers and fathers when they were dying and anoint them, to hear their confessions. It was a very, very, I could only use the word privilege. My life has been very privileged. I was very privileged to be allowed into people's lives in that way. Being a priest is a very privileged opportunity. And I liked what I did. I liked my job very much. And uh, the people liked me and I liked them. But there was something in my heart after some years that wasn't happy. And this is an important thing for us all to remember. Allah Almighty speaks to each one of us according to the person that we are. You know, some people, they read the, the scientific miracles in the Holy Quran and they go, wow, this is fantastic. I'm not a scientist and it leaves me cold. It doesn't do anything for me at all. Get, show me a beautiful sunset or a mountain scene and it will speak to me of Allah. People are different. That's why you're all married to different people. We find different things attractive. We're all different. So Allah calls us to himself according to the person that we are. So you must be in touch with who you are to know what he's saying to you. Well, the way he spoke to me was my heart was lonely. I was lonely inside. I liked my job. I had no problem at all with the church or with te the teaching or with the bishop. No problem. And I had no plan whatever to leave my religion. But I made the very difficult decision to leave the priesthood. You understand? I thought I was leaving my job. But I had no intention of not being a Catholic. You know, but Muslims often say to me, what was it about Christianity that you rejected? I rejected nothing. I left it. I came, I'll tell you how I came to Islam, but it wasn't through rejecting things. It was through embracing things. So I left the church. Now, not being Catholics, you don't know how important um, such a thing as leaving the priesthood is. It's like a death and a divorce and your house burning down all rolled into one. It's a major, major event. And I felt very, very low. I felt very low because Roman Catholics put their priests high on a pedestal. You know, they open doors and they stand up when you go into the room and speak to you in a very polite way. And for all that to happen and feel that you're letting people down, and it, it, was, it was tough. It really was tough. So I decided to myself that I needed, um, just forgive me while I, I do this, I, I needed a holiday. The sisters will know how when you're feeling a bit down, you go out and buy yourself a new hijab to cheer yourself up, okay? The brothers, you know, you're feeling a bit, you might go and buy yourself a new pair of trainers or a new hammer. You don't cheer yourself. Well, I needed a holiday. So I looked on the internet for the cheapest holiday I could find because I had no money, story of my life. And the cheapest holiday I got was a holiday to Egypt. I'd never been to Egypt. I didn't know anything about Egypt. I knew that Egypt had sand, palm trees, pyramids, Oh, and Muslims. I'd never met a Muslim in my life. All I knew about Muslims was what everyone knows, that they chop your hands off, and they blow themselves up, and they hit women, 
and that they're generally not very nice people. They're very aggressive, and violent, uncompromising. But I had no money, so I said to myself, well, I'm just going to have to take the risk. You know, I'll have to, if they kidnap me, what can I do? <laughs> so I, I went to, to Egypt on, on this package tour, and it was to a holiday on the, to, to a beach resort on the Red Sea. Um, Hergada, it's called. If you've not been, don't go. <laughs> I stayed for an hour because it just wasn't what I was looking for. I was looking for Egypt and this was like Italy or Spain. It was like a you know, European beach holiday. It's not what I was after. So I got on a bus and traveled all during the night to Cairo. And that visit to Cairo changed my life. Because for the first time in my life, I met Muslims. Now before I tell you about that, we go back to when I, when I was a young man teaching in school. I, I, it shows you how little I knew about Islam and how you know, young people can be very uh, conceited really in, in how certain they are about things. I went into class this morning. It was a Catholic school and there were all the kids who were Catholics except for one little girl at the front who was a little Muslim girl wearing her hijab. They were all 12 years old. And today, March the 25th, was the Feast of the Annunciation. Now, Catholics celebrate a Feast of the Annunciation when, when they believe that Gabriel, the angel Jibril, asks Mary, Mariam, if she will become the mother of Jesus. I, so that's what they celebrate. So full of myself, I went into the class and I said, Now, children, who can tell me what the angel Gabriel did? Nothing. No, no answer. I said, well, no, someone must know. What did the angel Gabriel do? And the little Muslim girl put her hand up. And I thought, oh, this is great. The non-believer knows. <laughs> so I said to her, what did the angel Gabriel do? He spoke to Prophet Muhammad, she said. I said, indeed he did not. Who knows what he really did? That's how much I knew about Islam. That's how much I knew. And from the pulpit in church, may Allah forgive me, I have spoken about the threat and the evil of Islam. And I knew nothing about it. May Allah forgive me. So I went to Egypt and for the first time in my life I met Muslims. Now, last night we were talking about how by our good example we bring people to Allah. And, and you know, the, the speakers go all over the world and think they're all sorts of fancy things and they talk about Allah, you know, crowds come and listen. And it could be the work of the one serving the tea who touches your heart tonight by a kind gesture. Forget what I say. It could be the one who opened the door to you or sold you one of my books. That's a little plug. We don't know who it is who's going to touch our hearts. The first Muslim I ever met was a little boy, 12 years old. And he was selling bananas in the street. And he was dressed in shabby clothes. They weren't dirty, but they were shabby. And he had little plastic flip-flops on his feet. And he, he was thin. And he saw me walking towards him and his face broke into a big smile. And he said to me, Assalamu alaikum. And he meant it. That's the first Muslim I ever met in my life. Assalamu alaikum. And then for the rest of the week, walking from my hotel, I would pass this little boy. And I learned that in Egyptian, you say, Zayak. Zayak ya Habibi. How are you doing? How's it going? And he would reply to me each morning, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, that was my introduction to Islam. No fancy sheikh with flowing robes. No Islamic channel on the TV. No book. Not even a Quran. The only Quran I met was that little boy. He was the Quran. Like our beloved Prophet was described by Isha as a walking Quran. That little boy brought me to Allah. 
Now that little boy never knew what became of me. He never saw me after that week. He's going to get the shock of his life on Judgment Day. The shock of his life. Because when his good deeds are read out and his bad, his bad deeds first, they'll read his deeds. And then they'll read his good deeds out. And when he thinks they've come to the end, that's where it'll start. They'll read out in his book all of the shahadas declared because of his behavior. They'll read out all the television programs and all the talks and the radio shows and the books and the articles. All the Facebooks and the email letters and questions and answers, all because of him. Without that little boy of 12 years old, I wouldn't be standing before you. Surely that tells us something. Surely that tells us how powerful each one of us is. Khalifa, Khalifa, we've listened to it. Khalifa, that's what we are. Problem is, one, we don't believe it. And two, we don't live it. But as sure as eggs are eggs, as we say in Britain, the actions of good Muslims have their effects on people. I know the effects that my words have sometimes, because people write to me and tell me, or they come to me afterwards and say, most of you won't know. You know, it could be that something you said to someone at the petrol station last week, in 30 years' time, might have an effect on his life. You'll never know. Just as that little boy never knew. So that was my introduction to Islam. And for the rest of the week, I, I met Muslims in, in, in Cairo. I went to the, um, the main railway station in Cairo, Ramsey Station. And when the Adan sounded for Salat al -Dur, I saw men go down on their knees and pray go down on their knees in the railway station and pray. I said, what is this? If you did this in London, they'd lock you up. <laughs> they'd think you were mad. Going to, I saw people getting on the bus saying, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, in the name of Allah. I saw people asking one another, does this bus go to central Cairo? Yes, it does, inshallah. It only, doesn't mean it might go. You know, we, we use insha'Allah, we don't always take seriously the gifts Allah gives us. Insha'Allah is a very beautiful way of, of helping us to remember Him at all times. You know, we say, are you going to the, the talk next week? Insha'Allah. It means you're not going. <laughs> but you say it to sound nice, you know? I mean, you've no intention of going. But, oh, insha'Allah, I'll be, oh, insha'Allah. But I saw these people get on the bus and, and they, does it go to central Cairo? Inshallah, it will go to central Cairo if Allah wills it to go to central Cairo. As Muslims, we believe that the sun will not come up tomorrow unless Allah wills it to be so. Another little word, the, the phrase we use, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. If we get ourselves into the practice of saying that, you see these words, these rituals we have in Islam, if, if they have no meaning for us, they become empty rituals. And we just become a nation of rituals, not a nation of faith. But all the things we do, like performing wudu, you know how, how, how you rush into the mosque and you run into the bathroom as quick as you can and splash a bit of water here and run out again. Wudu is a gift to each one of us. It's a gift that says, calm down. The busyness of life we're going to set aside just for five times during today. All the affairs of we're setting them aside. And, and we're going to calm down for a few moments, washing ourselves, washing away the dust of life and the dust that clings to our hearts to prepare ourselves to be in the presence of Allah Almighty. It's a gift. Bismillah, for example, we, if, if we train ourselves in all things to say Bismillah, it's a great protection. You know, we eat some food, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, we eat the food. We go into a room, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. If, may Allah forbid, one day we're offered a glass of whiskey and we, use it, we say Bismillah Rahman Rahim, we won't take it. 
It's a great safeguard in our lives. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Don't, don't throw away the gifts that Allah Almighty gives us. So that week I met Muslims. And on, on the last day I had to travel back again through the night to my holiday resort to get the plane back. And it was a Friday. Friday I was sitting in the little square and I was sitting in the cafe. And the prayers had begun. And the cafe, well the sermon had begun. And the cafe was still full of young men. They weren't fanatics, shall we say. You know, the first the dam had sounded, but they were still sipping their coffee until it was time to actually pray, okay? But when the, when the Adam came to pray, I was sitting, they all got up, and they walked across the road, and the, and the waiter took off his apron and walked across the road, and the man looking after the money in the till, he left the money in the till, and he crossed through, and I was left with all the money and everything in, in the... <laughs> And I said, what kind of a religion is this? What, what faith these people have. It's been my job all my life, I thought, to work, to tell people about faith. And this week, I'm meeting faith for the first time ever. So I returned home to, to the UK. I didn't know much about Islam, but I'd met Muslims. And I knew Muslims were not the saber-rattling fanatics that the television told me that they are. I knew something different. But when I, when I got back to London, I, I had no job, so I had to get myself a job. All my life I taught in schools, teaching religion, teaching the Catholic religion. Well, I got myself a job because of my background. I was qualified as head of religious education, but in a state school. Now in Britain, I don't know what you'd call them here, public schools maybe. In a public school, it's the law in Britain that the children are taught all of the six major world religions. Buddhism, Sikhism, Hinduism, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. So it was my job to teach the kids, not to make them into good Buddhists or good Sikhs or good Jews, but just to teach them information about the six religions for their public exams. So I knew about Christianity and I also knew about Judaism as well, that the two are very close. But I didn't know anything about the other four. So, students, I'll let you into a secret. Often teachers don't know what they're talking about. On the night before, I had to get the books out and learn Buddhism. What, what on earth do I know about this? I had to learn about Buddhism. But Islam, I had to teach these kids about Islam for their public exams. So I had to read the books every night so I didn't look a fool in front of the children the next day. These were 16 year olds ready for their public exams. So that was one thing. Now, as well, this school I, I ended up in by Allah's grace, it was one of the roughest schools I've ever been in my life. There were drugs and, and you name it, it was in the school. It was a tough place to be. But they were, they were good kids. Really, and I, and I liked it very much. And many of the kids, if not most, if not the majority, they were Arabs. They were refugees from different countries, North Africa and, and the Middle East. The Yemenis, especially, were particularly naughty. I don't know if there are any Yemenis here, but they were really naughty boys. So they were, I was teaching Islam to these kids who were Muslim. And after some months, you know, I, I got to like what I was reading. And I found myself, after maybe six months, I'd mention in class the name of Prophet Muhammad and I found a lump coming in my throat. You know, and I talk about the beauty of Islam. And I find tears coming in my eyes, so I'd have to <coughs> cover it up. You know, because they'd eat you if you showed any weakness. So I was teaching these kids about Islam. And then Ramadan came. And the kids came to me and they said, Sir, they said, it's Ramadan and we've got nowhere to pray. And your room is the only room in the school with a carpet. <laughs> what a coincidence, hey? <laughs> your room is the only room with a wash basin. Can we use your room to pray? So I said, yeah, yeah, I don't see why not. I'll have to speak to the headmaster first, but I can't see any problem. So I went to the head, and I said, uh, these Muslim kids want to pray in my room in Ramadan. Is it okay? He said, yeah, it's fine, but you must be in the room with them, because knowing these kids, they would steal the carpet. <laughs> so 
Ramadan started and I, I sat at the back of the classroom at my desk marking my books and preparing my lessons and the kids prayed. And for the first two or three days I paid no attention to them at all. And then after a few days I looked up, oh they're doing this now, oh yeah, oh now they're doing this. So I watched what they were doing and then I became so fascinated that I went off to the internet secretly and I learned the Arabic words they were saying. So when it came to the end of Ramadan, I knew how to pray. I knew what you did, and I knew what you said. And as well, at the start of Ramadan, when the kids had said, Sir, can we pray in your room? I'd said to them, well, look, I'm not Muslim, but in solidarity with you, I will fast during Ramadan with you. <laughs> so the end of Ramadan came, and I knew how to pray, and I'd fasted, and then time went on again. And months more went by. And I decided it was time for me to learn a little bit more about Islam for myself, not to teach anyone. Not for any exams, but just for me. Because by this stage, I liked Muslims. I was comfortable with Muslims. I knew they were good people. And I liked what they believed. So I went along to um, the biggest mosque in London called Regent's Park Mosque. And every Saturday they had what's called Islamic Circle, three o'clock in the afternoon, for new Muslims, people interested in Islam, and they would have general talks about the five pillars of Islam, Islamic history, and they were very interesting talks. And the people were, were no one was getting you to be Muslim, they, they just welcomed you and they were very polite and, and very professional. And then the last talk of all, was a talk given by uh, Yusuf Islam. You know Yusuf Islam, Cat Stevens, the singer. And he gave his talk, and I, I can't remember what he talked about, but at the end of the talk, I went to him and I said, Yusuf Islam, would you please tell me what do you actually do to be Muslim? I said, I don't want to be Muslim, but just what, what would you do if someone wanted to be Muslim, what would they do? He said, well, he said, Muslims believe in one God. I said, well, I've always believed in one God. I believe in one God. He said, and Muslims pray five times a day. I said, well, actually, I know how to say the prayers in Arabic. And he looked, he gave me a very strange look. And he said, and Muslims fast during Ramadan. I said, well, actually, I, I fasted last Ramadan as well. <laughs> And again, he looked at me intently in the eyes, like the Pope had done with the ring. And he said to me, brother, you are Muslim already. Who are you trying to fool? <laughs> and with those words ringing in my ears, brother, you are Muslim already. Who are you trying to fool? The Adan sounded for Salaf al-Maghrib. Allahu Akbar. So I heard this beautiful sound, the sweetest sound on earth. And in my head were these words, brother, you are Muslim already. Who are you trying to fool? And we all went from downstairs up into the prayer hall. And, and the, the brothers prayed here and the, the sisters prayed up in the, the beautiful gallery above. And I sat at the back against the wall. And when the prayer began, I cried and I cried and I cried. And it was, it was as if angels, hundreds of thousands of angels came into the mosque. And I listened to Quran being recited. And I knew that from the beginning of time, Allah wanted me to be Muslim. And I went to Yusuf Islam after the prayer and I said, Brother, I want to be Muslim, tell me what to do. He said, you must say, Ashahadu an la ilaha illallah. I believe that there is no God but Allah. And I believe that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. So I said the words and all the brothers came and hugged me and embraced me and congratulated me. And Yusuf Islam said to me, now you must go home and take a bath or a shower because you must feel in your body what has just happened to you. He said, you are like a newborn baby that has come into the world. 
without any sins. He said, you're the best Muslim in this mosque. You are without any sin at all. That's Islam. Yeah, the television tells us about bombers and suicide attacks. That is Islam. Sweet and beautiful. It will reduce the strongest man to tears. And so since then, my life has been totally different. I had no plan, absolutely no plan whatever, to, to talk, give talks about Islam. But what would I talk about? I don't know anything about Islam. In fact, you know more about Islam than I do. You really, you've been Muslim all your lives. You, since you were that high, you've been learning about Islam. I'm still learning. I'm a baby. I've been Muslim for nine years. I'm still learning. I'm still hoping I do do something wrong. And people say, oh, why are you praying like that? You know? Why aren't your toes praying in such a direction? And, and by the way, just as a little aside, be very gentle with people who are new to Islam. Be very gentle with them. It's a big thing to, to give up everything and become Muslim. It really is big. Many Muslims, new Muslims I know, you know, they've been thrown out of their homes. Their families have abandoned them. Their husband, there's one lovely girl who declared shahada after a talk I gave in, in Dublin. Her husband, who was Muslim, divorced her. He said to her, if you become Muslim, I will divorce you. And she did, and bless her. She, she now has taken the name Aisha and she writes to me regularly, Alhamdulillah, she's a great example. So be very gentle, you know. As soon as the declare shahada, resist getting the hijab straight on the head. You know, G give people time. Give them, let them make their own mistakes. You know, let, let, let them slowly get used to praying. It's very difficult to learn to pray five times a day. It's difficult if you're 40. It's difficult to sit on the floor. It still hurts my back to sit on the floor. You know, if you're growing up sitting on the foot, it kills me. So be, be very gentle with those who do Islam. There's no need to tell them about Sharia law. The first week they become Muslim. They've got a lifetime to learn that. Tell them that Allah is loving and kind. Tell them that Prophet Muhammad is a mercy to mankind. Tell them what's important first. And then all the other things can follow on and will have great meaning. If you tell them all the rules and regulations without the meaning, well, what's the point of them knowing them? The Prophet Muhammad then told us, a very beautiful hadith I keep repeating. He said that the one who has not tasted the sweetness and the goodness of Islam in this world will not taste its sweetness and goodness in the next. And I think he meant Muslims. Islam is sweet and good, and there are many Muslims who don't know that yet. You can sit on their faces, their faces are very harsh. Let me just tell you a quick story. When, is it nearly time for me to finish? Okay. When I, when I first time I went to Saudi Arabia for Umrah, I performed the, the, the rituals of Umrah in Mecca, and then traveled to Medina. Now you know Medina is such a beautiful, sweet, peaceful place. And I was sitting at the Prophet's mosque وسلم, in the afternoon, and it was very hot. And I'd said my prayers, and I, and I was reciting Quran, and, and making dua, and thinking about those I love. And a man came in over here with his four sons. Now, by the way he was dressed, he was from one of those former Soviet republics, something as Stan. And his face was lined with severity, very, very harsh. And, and he walked in. And behind him, his four sons, this high, this high, this high, and this high, followed him in. And they marched the same. <laughs> and he led them in prayer. The five of them lined up and prayed, Salat al-Asr. And I, I said to myself at the time, if only television cameras could have been here today. They would have seen a man so attentive to the upbringing of his sons. They would have seen kids infinitely attentive to their father, loving and respectful of their father. They would have seen a man and his sons praying. But then there was more. They, they lay on the floor to sleep, to take some rest. It was very hot. And I was watching. I, I watched the whole episode. 
Now, after two minutes, the little one, he was only about six, and he couldn't sit still. So he started tickling his father's toes. And after a further minute, all five of them were roaming around on the floor, laughing and cuddling and kissing and squeezing one another and joking. And I thought again, if only the cat, this is a slam. This is it, we've seen them pray, and we now see the love they have for each other. This is the real Islam. You know, there are so many people telling us, go to right and left. You know, we're told very clearly that Islam is neither to right nor left, but it's the middle way that you may be an Ummah justly balanced, not veering to right or to left. So let me finish, it's time to finish. I could go on all night, but I've got to finish. We'll have some questions, I think. I finish with a little story um, and, a, and a reading from this Gardens of Delight book. Where, when Princess Diana died 10 years or so ago, 10, maybe 11 years now, I, I was a priest in London and I, I attended her funeral. And I remember on the morning of the funeral, I was lined up in uh, Hyde Park and the, the pavement was about 10 deep with people. It was totally silent, 6 in the morning. You heard a little sob occasionally, total silence. And then in the distance, you heard the clip clop, clip of the horses as they came down the, down the road, carrying the, uh, the, the coffin on the gun carriage with the, the lilies on the top from the two boys. And, and someone shouted out, Diana, we love you. And people started crying and screaming. And, and you, you've seen the rest, people throwing flowers and the whole nation. It was an extraordinary week. On the BBC, first time in my life I've ever seen it, the, the report, the news presenters dressed with black ties and purple curtains behind them. You know, it was an extraordinary week in Britain and to be a priest. And, and you know, that week people were asking questions. It seems to me that what happened last week, they were saying she was the people's princess, Diana, we love you. They didn't know her from Adam. They didn't know her at all. They didn't know what she was like. All they knew was what the television showed them. She was beautiful and glamorous, and she mixed with film stars and, and fancy people, uh, and, and she was compassionate to people who were sick and suffering, and also her own life had experienced tragedy. Her marriage had broken down. So people loved her. But it seemed to me, watching what happened that week in Britain, was that the people of Britain which has lost its way. They seem to be mourning not the death of a princess, but they seem to be mourning the death of goodness and of beauty and of all those things that their hearts are longing for that the media and society had quashed and kept down and don't talk about these things. And people that week asked me, why does God allow this to happen? Why does he let little children die? Why does he allow tsunamis to kill hundreds of thousands of people? And I end the book this way, and we'll end our, our few words tonight in the same way. Our young, our young boy knows the answer to all those questions about life's meaning. Islam has taught him there is no distinction for him between religion and life. He is neither weird nor an extremist nor a fanatic. He's just a perfectly ordinary young man trying to earn enough money to feed himself and his family. Does praying make him a fanatic, he asks? Does trying to help others less fortunate than him make him weird? Does dreaming about going on a once-in-a-lifetime pilgrimage to Mecca make him an extremist? We often fear that which we don't understand. Islam is much misunderstood in today's world. If our only knowledge of Islam comes from distorted news headlines, we're sure to live forever in fear of what we don't really know. If we can begin to see Islam through the eyes of Muslims themselves, like our young boy, we might begin to understand. Muslims remain bewildered that their religion is not only misunderstood, but vilified as a religion of fanatics. Our young boy, Ali or Hassan or Muhammad, knows that Islam is the religion of peace. 
misunderstood by many who are not Muslim, he will carry on through the harsh realities of life, trying his best to be a good person. Several times a day he will declare his belief in the oneness of Allah and that Muhammad is his messenger, alayhi salatu was salam. He'll go quickly to pray when he hears Allahu Akbar from the mosque. He will pay zakat if ever he has enough money to pay it. But he'll always think of those even less better off than he. He will look forward all year to the coming of Ramadan, when he will fast with all his heart and soul during daylight hours. And it will be his life's dream to go on pilgrimage to Mecca in response to Allah's call. And then the final words are these. His hope and his prayer will be that when his time on earth is over, he will look back on a life well lived. He has lived the secret according to the principles of Islam. Now he will hope to hear these words of the Quran as if Allah were addressing them to him alone. But are thou soul at peace? Return unto thy Lord, content in his good pleasure. Enter thou among my servants. Enter thou my garden. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.